So postural things, nutritional things, emotional well-being such as anxiety, all these things af affect respiration. If respiration is affected, everything below, meaning the TMJ, the cervical spine, vision, hearing, the atlas, the shoulder, the spine, the SI joint, on and on and on, even the organs, everything is going to be compromised. It's kind of as above, so below system, and this is the system we used. So if you see someone that has back pain, that could be coming from a respiratory problem. And years ago, there's a chiropractor named Dijarnay, and he actually showed how you can develop a disc protrusion from a respiratory problem. So we breathe normally, right? When we breathe, we intake oxygen and we release carbon dioxide. Respiration is also good for the mobilization of cerebral spinal fluid. So when you breathe, you actually create a normal pump through your body. That pump of extension and flexion, okay, causes cerebral spinal fluid to go up the spine to the ventricles, and then down from the ventricles to the spine. It's like a bit, it's a bath for the, um, for the spine. Okay, so you're naturally breathing like this. Most people don't breathe in this normal pattern. Obviously, you don't accentuate it, but it's extension and flexion. So if you don't breathe like that, what happens is stand a client up or do it yourself, close your eyes and breathe and look at the person from the side and what you'll see is they'll sway back and forth. And that's your way or the body's way of compensating for a faulty respiratory pattern. So after some time, secondary to the law of facilitation and the body always compensates secondary to patent overload, you start moving in different planes of motion. So instead of moving in the sagittal plane, right, front to back, trying to mimic the cerebral spinal pump because you're breathing improperly, the body starts to move in the frontal plane, which is side to side. And if you start breathing in the frontal plane or compensating in the frontal plane because you can't breathe properly and you've developed all these compensations, right, anytime you move laterally, you're more prone to a disc bulge, okay? You can do more research about that. It's actually on the new, uh, one, um, some of our new audio programs in past audio programs. It actually shows that slide. Breathing properly also helps maintain acid and alkaline balance, okay? Super important in our body. It feeds O2 to the blood or oxygen to the blood and it actually provides the body with chi or energy, okay? It's our body's energy bank account. That's why doing qigong and things like that is very beneficial to help with respiration but also provide the body with working in instead of working out, which is more anabolic and it provides the body with energy instead of expending energy. Okay. We normally breathe 20,000 times a day. We use different muscles. We use primary muscles and we use accessory muscles. If you breathe invertedly, meaning through the chest and not the diaphragm and the belly, you actually breathe 40,000 times a day. There's a problem with that. Now, your muscles of respiration are the diaphragm. That's the primary muscle of respiration. Okay. Second, there's accessory muscles, and these are muscles of inspiration. The accessory muscles are the scalenes, the SCM, levator scapula, serratus anterior, pec minor, and subclavius. These all help to lift the rib cage so when you breathe, you can pull in air. Now you have expiratory muscles, okay? Some primary ones are the TVA, internal oblique, external oblique, rectus abdominis, and intercostals. Okay, there's expiratory muscles. The accessory muscles of expiration are the quadratus lumborum, iliocostalis, and the serratus posterior inferior. Not to get technical, but what I'm really saying is when you breathe 40,000 times a day because you breathe invertedly, now you're using your accessory muscles of respiration as prime movers. They're not meant to do all that work. So they, they overwork 20,000 times a day. A lot of these muscles originate in the shoulder or the ribs or the neck and they go to the head. So you see a lot of people that have chronic headaches, chronic neck pain and shoulder pain okay, are breathing invertedly. So we see neck pain, shoulder pain all the time. Is it the respiration that's causing the shoulder and neck pain, or is it really the shoulder and neck? Well, I can tell you from assessing respiration, most people have faulty respiratory patterns and trigger points in all these muscles. Okay, it's very common. Ask any massage therapist. People have trigger points here. Do massage, massage, massage. They still have trigger points. It's because they haven't really got to the root of the problem, which is respiration. Now, the importance of breathing. The diaphragm is actually a respiratory muscle but it actually is a stabilizer muscle. So when you inhale and exhale, the diaphragm is like a dome and it actually massages all your organs. So you see people that are chronically constipated, it's because one of the reasons is many, but one of the reasons is they're breathing invertedly. So when you're using your chest muscles or accessory muscles, instead of your diaphragm, you don't get that nice massage 
which actually helps with peristalsis to move food along, you end up with constipation. At the same time, the, re the diaphragm attaches to L2, L3. So not to get too technical, but when you breathe properly, and you activate your core muscles, or what we call your inner unit, you actually cause a traction because the diaphragm attaches to L2, L3. So it pulls on L2, L3, decompresses L4, L5. So it actually serves to decompress L4, L5 and stabilize the low back. Now, where's the most common place people end up with a disc derangement, or a slip disc as doctors like to call it? Research shows L4, L5. So, do they have a disc problem because of whatever, or is faulty respiration and lack of stabilization contributing to it? That's my feeling on it. Another interesting thing about breathing in the diaphragm is there's a part of the diaphragm that the actually the vena cava from the heart actually pierces right through the diaphragm. Interesting, huh? So the vena cava pierces right through the diaphragm. Now, if you have trigger points in your diaphragm, if you're kyphotic like this and you're locked, locked in expiration, if you have a lot of anxiety or you're breathing 40,000 times a day instead of 20,000 times a day, the diaphragm actually becomes very hypertonic and it can actually impinge or pierce down on the vena cava. What does that equate to? The heart or the blood vessels or the, the, um, the vena cava, the pump has to work harder. What does that equate to? Increased blood pressure. Interesting, huh? Well, how do we have faulty respiration? Well, we can have it from stress, which can cause anxiety, increased respiratory rate. Think about it when you get you know, anxious because you know, someone cut you off. You always see the respiratory rate go up, okay? So if you're chronically stressed or chronically under anxiety, well, you can have faulty respiration because you end up breathing with the chest instead of the belly, or we say the diaphragm. A lot of people say the belly, which is incorrect, but um, it's really the diaphragm. So stress can cause faulty respiration. Nutrition. Most people are chronically dehydrated, not drinking enough water. Well, when you don't drink enough water, the airways need water to keep the airways moist so you can intake oxygen, get rid of carbon dioxide. Well, when you're chronically dehydrated, the body tries to preserve the rest of the water that it has. So it actually builds mucus to actually keep the airways moist. So this mucus buildup actually inhibits respiration, okay? So chronic dehydration can cause faulty respiration. Decreased sodium balance in the body, okay? So the interesting thing is with this one, most people, because they're eating a crap diet of, you know, conventional foods, refined foods, additives and preservatives, a lot of these things cause inflammation in the body. With inflammation, you see increased histamine in the body. Histamine is a neurotransmitter. It actually helps regulate water metabolism. But too much histamine causes vas vasoconstriction, okay? So if you have chronic inflammation, if you're dehydrated, you're eating crap foods, you're going to have increased histamine, which causes increased vasoconstriction, right? You do the math on that. Vasoconstriction causes what? Decreased respiration. You have to breathe shorter and harder to actually get a breath in, okay? So it's interesting with that how dehydration and inflammation from faulty you know, nutrition can cause a respiratory problem. At the same time, you see a lot of people, what do they do when they get up in the morning? A lot of people grab orange juice. Well, most of the orange juice today is shit, to be honest with you. A lot of it, though, has potassium in it. There's been research by a doctor named Dr. Batman Jilic, and he showed that increased potassium in the body causes increased histamine in the body. Histamine, once again, causes vasoconstriction. So you can see how all these things can cause respiratory problems. And we can go on and on and on, but I'm just giving you some insight. On the postural side of it, there was actually some research that was done on monkeys. And the second they blocked their nose, right, it was in, I think, within 20 to 30 seconds, they actually developed forward head posture, kyphosis, which affects respiration, okay? So if you feel like you have faulty respiration, or you have a respiratory problem, or your son has asthma, or you're playing a sport and you have, you know, decreased O2 capacity, or you have increased mucus buildup, or you want to see if you have a respiratory problem, first thing is...